At the top of any shadow organization is an individual of whom the actions of said organization ultimately fall upon. The nature of the operations these government bodies undertake means their leaders have to be ones with questionable ethics. Sociopaths who can forego morality and emotion when planning missions, and who have faith that the means, no matter how disturbing, always justify the end. As you'd expect, the Office of Naval Intelligence are no exception to this, and their leaders have given the green light to some of the most disturbing events in human history. These are the dark, shadowed leaders of Oni. Oni's meddling and misdeeds began far before first contact was made with the Covenant. Prior to 2525, humanity's main focus was a galaxy-wide insurrection, sparked by the United Earth Government's neglect of and overbearing bureaucracy over the outer colonies. Peaceful protests eventually turned into violent riots, and eventually a full-blown insurrection, leading to the involvement of the UNSC and thus Oni to quell the violence. It was here where our first leader gained notoriety. Admiral Margaret Parangoski was given the position of Sinkoni, standing for Commander-in-Chief of Oni around 2511. One of her earliest recorded actions as Sinkoni was to seize control of Onyx. When archaeological expeditions discovered these strange metal structures on the planet, which later turned out to be foreigner structures, Oni immediately took control of the world, removing it from all UNSC navigational databases and officially classifying it. Years later, in the heat of the Human Covenant War, Parangoski would find a use for Onyx after years of science teams failing to understand or extract any technology from these structures. Colonel James Ackerson, a high-ranking and notorious member of Oni and the UNSC Army, proposed a new series of soldier, an initiative that would produce a large number of effective, yet purposefully expendable super soldiers, which was a downside of the Spartan IIs. This initiative was the Spartan III program, a proposal which Parangoski instantly agreed upon designating Onyx as the top secret training facility for Alpha Company, the first group of Oni's new line of super soldiers. However, in 2537, all 300 remaining active members of Alpha Company were exterminated during Operation Prometheus, one of the bloodiest wars in human history. Upon being informed of this traumatic outcome, Parangoski simply stated that the loss of these heroes was regrettable. Her most unnerving plan as Sinconi, however, was an operation codenamed Red Flag, which would have hypothetically used the planet Reach as bait to draw in a large Covenant armada. This would then allow Spartans to board a Covenant cruiser, use its nav data to locate High Charity, commandeer the cruiser, and then fly it to High Charity to capture a profit to be used as a bargaining ship to try and stop the Covenant. The reason that Reach was chosen was because of the incredibly high probability that eventually in the near future, the Covenant would find it. Now, although this was only ever spoken about hypothetically in emails and never actually happened, the fact that it merely crossed the mind of her as a possible future operation is disturbing enough given the militaristic significance of Reach and the danger that it would have posed to humanity by using it as bait. Reach was the final defence before Earth, and if humanity put it in any weaker of a state than it needed to be, it would have almost certainly spelled the doom of humanity. Following humanity's eventual victory in the war, Parangoski and Oni found themselves in dispute with the UNSC and UEG about the treatment of the elites. Where the latter wished for peace with the Arbiter's elites, Parangoski feared an uprising down the line, and intended to ensure that the Sangheili were never going to be strong enough to ever truly rebel. One of her most disturbing intentions, although far-fetched, was to one day systematically exterminate the elites and colonize Sanghelios for humanity, should Oni's plans to elongate their civil wars and keep them pressed down weak fail. Some years prior, she'd rescued a potential Spartan II, who'd failed the augmentation process but actually survived, Serin Osman. From therein, she'd begun grooming Serin as her successor for Oni Chief in Command, and in 2553, was selected by Parangoski to lead a highly classified Black Ops squad, Kilo 5. The squad was formed to carry out Parangoski's counterinsurgency campaign against the elites, disguised as a diplomatic operation. 
Kilo 5 were ultimately responsible for secretly assisting the Servants of Abiding Truth, a Covenant faction that was at war with the Arbiter by supplying them with arms, the sabotage of some of the Arbiter's ships, capturing the Pious Inquisitor so Parangoski could reverse engineer its glassing beam to be used against elite colony worlds, and to this day continue to undertake highly classified operations to sow dissent within the elites and ensure that they remain in a weakened state right where only want them. In 2555, Seren Osman would finally succeed Parangoski as Oni's chief in command, and when Cortana's guardian arrived at Earth, she, along with Lord Hood, Black Box, and also a number of military AIs, just managed to jump into slipstreams with a prowler, evading the EMP blast. She took with her a dark, deep history of betrayal against the elites, a philosophy passed down to her by her mentor and previous in command. Ultimately, it takes a unique personality to command Oni. Those who seek the throne must be completely devoid of any emotion, willing to get their hands dirty and intervene in places they definitely don't belong, all to further this supposed greater good of humanity. Operations must be signed off that any normally functioned human being would be disgusted by and would consider a crime against humanity, but this throne is one only habitable by those who lack the morality to let simple emotions get in the way of any form of the greater good. Speaking of thrones, this video was sponsored by Quersus. They very, very kindly handcrafted and sent me my own custom-made iconic gaming chair, and one to give away to one lucky viewer. This thing is absolutely beautiful. Like, it was so easy to put together. It took, like, probably five minutes, honestly. And it is so damn comfy to sit in and just to, just to chill in, edit videos, play RuneScape, you know, the usual things. But without a doubt, the absolute piece de la resistance is the official Hidden Xperia logo woven into the headrest. Now, I'm not joking when I say that this is the iconic throne and only two of these will ever exist. Of course, your boy's got one of them and soon one of you guys will do too. At the top of the description will be a Gleam link. So what you do is you just click on that link and follow these super simple instructions and you'll be in for a chance to be the only other person on planet Earth to own the official iconic throne. Major thanks to Quersus for this. I really appreciate it. The chair is beautiful. It's so comfy. It looks so damn good. I really appreciate it. And good luck to everybody entering. I want to thank my Patreon supporters as per usual, Ardent, Tomahawk, Taylor, Evan, Momo, Shikata, Mjolnir, Matthew, Pierre, Tony, Ben, Jim, Regan, Quantum, Jack Madden, Eric Brown, Sam Grafton, and Bruin98 for the continued support. I really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed some more dark, conspiracy-fueled Halo content. Only, only really are a lovely bunch, aren't they? Really are a lovely bunch. There's definitely more of this content coming very, very soon. And I'll catch you in the next one.